Thank you, sir, for speaking with ANI. Wish you a very happy new year. Yeah, same to you and to all your uh, viewers. Uh, and congratulations for the book, Why Bharat Matters. Uh, if I may say so, it's a very readable and uh, user-friendly book. Okay. Um, as uh, somebody who's done reporting on uh, foreign policy, many incidents that you mention in the book, one is seen at close quarters. And mm -hmm. you being a practitioner of foreign policy as a diplomat, as, as a politician now, um, you've seen the, it at very close quarters. Uh, so who did you really have in mind while writing the book? Because when I read it, I felt it's, it's anybody can get lessons from that, not just journalists, not just people in think tanks, but who did you have in mind? Well, if you got a sense that anybody could uh, use it, I think I then appear to have succeeded in what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, uh, I mean, if you look at the last uh, decade, uh, there have been enormous changes, there have been enormous changes in the country, mm -hmm. but especially in foreign policy with which I have personally been involved. You know. mm -hmm. So, uh, I have really at the beginning of the book tried to uh, explain why I wrote the book which is unless a person who is themselves involved in the process of change starts narrating the story and explaining it, people do not necessarily understand it. Now, when I say people, I actually mean the general public. Yeah. Uh, because one of my points I make is foreign policy is important for everybody today. It's not something which people in South Block or, you know, or even I would say the, uh, the larger uh, political class or, or the people involved in diplomacy have stakes in. You know, I've tried to bring out how the, uh, the av you know, the normal people, the average people uh, have stakes. Mm -hmm. But some of it is also because what has been happening in the world. I mean, if you look uh, at the last, even the last five years, I mean, we've had COVID, uh, we've had, you know, Afghanistan, uh, the Taliban takeover, we've had problems on our border with China, uh, we've but had... In the uh, book, you don't just mention it as, uh, okay, we've had these problems. I like how it becomes relevant to me as a layperson when you talk about Vande Bharat and how I as a layperson would be connected to foreign policy because of Vande Bharat or the, you know, the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sorry, the uh, evacuation of... Yeah. Uh, people, right. the Ganga, yes. uh, Operation Ganga, then you talk about several things, the COVID diplomacy. So it makes it, uh, you know, relatable when well, it comes to. No, absolutely. Because, you know, what I've tried to do is to say, okay, look, here is a big picture. And here is what people would normally say, you know, very complex diplomacy. Okay, there's a MEA and a foreign service and a minister who handle and a government which handles all of this. I have tried to show, yes, we may be doing all that, but every one of these somewhere impacts your life. That if we take a stand, let us say, on the Russia-Ukraine conflict, we have done so because we are shielding the Indian consumer from unreasonable increases in the petrol price yeah. uh, at the pump. Or if uh, there is a COVID challenge, uh, we have mounted this massive mission, uh, Vande Bharat, uh, which actually you know brings back 7 million people. Yeah, like as a mother who has a son or a daughter stuck in Ukraine, yeah, exactly. yeah. would have thought that foreign policy doesn't really matter to till, me till, till, that, till that happened. No, and, and you know, and again, the point I make is, look, these are no longer going to be one-off situations. Yeah. That, you know, there's Ukraine, there is, I mean, recently Operation Ajay in Israel, there's yeah. uh, uh, Operation Kaveri uh, in, uh, in Sudan. That because Indians are working abroad, because Indians are studying abroad, because you and I and mm. hundreds, if not millions of families are also traveling abroad. Yeah. You know, people go as tourists. We, you know, if you look at merchant shipping today, look at air crew, look at the people working in hotels, people who have jobs, blue collar jobs abroad. So we are globalizing. We need to know what those big dangers are out there. Mm. Uh, and in a sense, that's why a lot of the, I would say, the examples and the metaphors I've used. Yeah. You know, the, the big dangers, sometimes all the players are not aware what it means to you. But at the end of the day, it means something to everybody personally. Correct. And uh, the other interesting thing that I liked in the book was the allegorical references and the metaphors that you drew from the Ramayana. 
Mm -hmm. uh, mostly when we read books about uh, foreign policy or statecraft or uh, national security, they derive their references and their metaphors from say the Mahabharat. Mm -hmm. But uh, I found it interesting that you found lessons on statecraft, diplomacy, everything from the Ramayana. And that was very interesting because I mean, things like uh, what Vibhishan did or Valivad, uh, that you know, when it comes to statecraft, you could draw from that epic was very interesting. Uh, why, yeah. why Ramayana? Well, uh, there's, there's both a logic and an incident. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the incident actually was uh, when I was preoccupied writing the book, uh, uh, I, I was, uh, I'd gone to give a talk about my previous book. Okay. And somebody actually asked me, my recollection is it's in, it was in Pune, uh, saying that, look, uh, you've uh, used Mahabharat, so you know, have you ever thought about using uh, Ramayana as a as a mm. context, uh, as a as a, something to draw from? Uh, and uh, it was there somewhere at the back of my mind, but I think that incident mm. uh, compelled me to look at it. But the other, there's another reason also. The other reason is, look, Ramayana. Um, there's there's a difference in era. Mm. You know, uh, even in what are norms and standards. I mean, mm. by the time you reach Mahabharat, uh, it's absolute real politic. I mean, you know, uh, uh, whereas I think it's important today to remind people that a reputation also has a value, that uh, it is it is not something, you know, which is uh, hot air and, you know, it's not posturing, that mm. uh, standards mean something, rule of law means something, mm. norms do, uh, do, do count. So, but even those who have a higher purpose have to practice statecraft and those who practice statecraft must always remember the higher purpose. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you know, uh, I've tried to, in, in Rama and really also to bring out the, the uh, I, I would say the, the ethical or the, you know, are striving at the end of the day for a better world. Mm. You know, not that we win any which way and mm -hmm. and take what we get. In the book, while reading the book, uh, it's a bit confusing. Am I reading a book written by an academician? Am I reading a book written by a diplomat turned politician? Or am I reading a book written by a politician turned academic once again? It's like a I can't figure out like, you know, when you read a book, you want to know what the author is, who the author is, why is he looking at this prism? So what are you writing as? Uh, I think a mixture of all of them. You know, the the diplomat uh, in me has a, in a sense, you can say the domain knowledge and the experience which I talk about. The politician in me feels the need to communicate that to to, as we said, to the, to the everyday world, to mm. the normal, you know, uh, uh, to the Samanya Nagrik, you can say. And uh, in a sense, you know, look, if there are uh, perhaps two, uh, two sagas, two stories, if all of us have grown up with, this is really the Ramayana and Mahabharata, you know. Mm. Uh, and uh, we often use so much of the uh, metaphors and the situations and the comparisons in our normal life. You sure. know, uh, you know, if I were to talk to you chatting, I may bring up some some uh, reference there. So why I use that was also to remind people, look, we are a, you know, uh, multiple sort of uh, uh, millennia old civilization. When we discuss the world, you know, can we think about doing it on our terms and in our, you know, in our framework, in our construct. So there was that part of it also, you know, that uh, for me to, to think of the world, you know, I mean, as you can see, what I've tried to do is to take a particular theme and to try to, to uh, give it a Ramayan type relevance. Mm -hmm. So, so say, for example, uh, I've used the coalition building, you know, co how Lord Ram very carefully constructs a coalition and what it takes to construct a coalition, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't happen by itself. 
or even even you know in diplomacy uh, i mean uh, you've heard me say before that the two uh, preeminent examples of diplomats are uh, you know hanuman mm-hmm. and shri krishna but there are others you know angad for example or even his mother tara mm-hmm. uh, these are people who in very difficult situations practice their uh, diplomatic uh, skills so i like the vibhishan uh, part too you know the vibhishan part that was very interesting and i wanted uh, you to expound on that i wanted more details because many times we think of vibhishan as okay traitor mm-hmm. from one aspect so, but so, you said that there's more to it well i i you know i the the two angles from which i've approached vibhishan one of course that vibhishan itself in a sense is a person torn between uh, between a, uh, you know a commitment to to the right you know mm-hmm. to the to dharma on one side and and the uh, fact that he is from mm-hmm. uh, lanka and mm-hmm. really you know he is ravan's brother uh, so that's that's the dilemma that he has but i have also tried to put the other side i mean we always think of when you say vibhishan uh, what is he but mm-hmm. think of what must have been passing through uh, ram's mind when vibhishan turns up so and is it then, ethically or morally right what he did and then you bring it to i don't want to be a spoiler and explain how you uh, bring that with today's india but it is interesting how you draw the parallel out there you know one is the ethical moral but there's also this there's a question uh, you know is lord rama isn't he being smart yeah that he is actually judged him well partly because of hanuman hmm. huh? hanuman has given him the input this allows him to make a judgment about vibhishan which actually is not shared by those around him hmm. you know they are very suspicious of him yeah whereas he realizes the value hmm. of what it means to have someone like this on his side hmm. and also for the general good of the people you keep doing saying that that it's not just uh, being moralistic in in isolation that one sees uh, the stories from ramayana everything is associated with the good of the people yeah. in mind and i like how you bring the parallels well, uh, in today's political mm. parlance i would say delivery on the ground <laughs> huh? so you know if if you are doing something and that doing something means effective delivery for the population you know tell me what can be nobler than delivering uh, good to people and changing the lives for the better i have to ask you about the title mm-hmm. uh, it's why bharat matters bharat and india interchangeable and you come to the title of the book in the very last chapter yes. so usually again like i said that many presumptions that one has while picking up a book written by a minister uh, would you overturn many of that in this book and one is that you tell us only in the last chapter why bharat matters uh, well again you know i want people to read the other 10 <laughs> chapters before getting there but uh, look uh, i you know there's a very active debate right now uh, i i think in many ways uh, uh, obviously people use that debate for their own uh, narrow purposes the fact is to me uh, the term bharat has a certain uh, not just a cultural civilizational connotation but also one of a certain confidence and identity and uh, you know and at what terms you how you perceive yourself and because that is my business what are the terms you are offering to the world so i i don't uh, you know this is this is not to me something which is a narrow political uh, debate or i would even say in that sense a historical cultural debate it is a mindset uh, and the the point i make is that if we are actually preparing uh, seriously for the amrit kal next 25 years if we are talking of a viksit bharat a developed bharat that can only happen if you are an atmanirbhar bharat in 2024 we complete 10 years uh, of prime minister modi uh, being in office uh, you've been ambassador foreign secretary eam uh, during this tenure what have been the where do you see the pivot happen in indian foreign policy and uh, what are the what were the challenges when you took over as foreign secretary as eam uh, 
what are the goals and uh, that were given to you mm-hmm. uh, when you took uh, well uh, again i have tried to uh, bring that out in the book uh, in a account of what uh, uh, i have put as a decade of transformation but you've hmm? not talked about it personally that's what it's not a memoir that's no, what no it's I'm, not a memoir yeah, it's, so. it's not a memoir i mean i i you can't write a memoir when you are still holding a job <laughs> you know Uh, so uh, the I have tried, you know, I have tried to be very objective about it. Mm. You know, in a in a way, I'm a participant, but I'm also a person uh, trying to uh, deliberately take myself out and look at it. Uh, very, Several very, prisms going uh, on. Yeah, there. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, I would say it was not so much that there was a turning point. I mean, unless and and you can call 2014 as a turning point. once you know uh, modi comes in in 2014 uh, and uh, uh, really weighs the foreign policy which now he's he's taken charge of uh, that's that's essentially the chapter which i described where uh, you can see you know he he feels the need for a new construct that one where the neighborhood uh, very generous uh, non reciprocal policy towards the neighborhood which brings the neighborhood in closer to the fact that we have uh, an extended zone the mandalas that, that you talk yes, about yes the you know the uh, southeast asia uh, indian ocean uh, the gulf uh, central asia now we had done made some progress definitely in southeast asia but if you look for example at the gulf hmm. i mean it was amazing i mean this is a region so near us so many indians living there so much oil imported from there yet politically very very neglected I mean, a country like UAE, for example, had not had a prime ministerial visit from before Modi went there from the time of Indira Gandhi. Uh, so, and then you will look at the Indian Ocean. You know, again, we were dealing with it like you know this piecemeal. island, that island, mm-hmm. yes, piecemeal. I mean, there wasn't a single uh, integrated uh, construct. And uh, again, in the case of uh, Central Asia, that intensity of of connection was not there. Then the ability really to engage. Uh, multiple uh, power, the major powers engage not in the sense of oh keep us out of your problems because that's a kind of like i don't want to get caught in the big debates of the day that's not what we are saying we are saying yes we have stakes in the big debates of the day i will take my call but i there's no exclusivity in any of my relationships i reserve the right to deal with each one of you as per my national interest and uh, also uh, preparing for a larger uh, footprint hmm. you know global footprint then the entire approach to the diaspora has under undergone a change absolutely yeah. from 2014 oh. onwards yeah. Yeah. they were suddenly in center focus right. and uh, they remain so because initially it seemed as if there were many articles which came up and articles which said that this is just the start uh you know it as as soon as mr modi gets uh, grip of the foreign policy he's going to ignore uh the the diaspora and get on with the leaders but that's not happened well i think as has been the case for last 10 years a lot of people who been writing about it really do have no idea what is happening what uh, to expect at least nobody knows yes so so maybe by writing this book i may be doing everybody a service at least by demystifying give, you know it. saying okay here is a logic here is a narrative yeah. uh, why you know why don't i'm sure those who are open minded enough to want to learn uh, would would probably uh, find some uh, benefit but uh, the uh, the other part is also if you look at the big global issues of the day hmm. you know that uh, say for example climate change you know we were perceived as one of the countries holding back Uh, today actually yeah. whether it is uh, international solar alliance the disaster resilient coalition uh, you know uh, in fact uh, having been uh, with prime minister modi in paris in glasgow recently in uh, dubai uh, we have actually sort of taken the lead when it comes to the cop uh, meetings and uh, so uh, i i will read out a couple of quotes uh, from the book uh in in one of them you say diplomacy is about chemistry and credibility uh, and you keep referring to that in the uh, book several times about how this chemistry especially with uh, the prime minister and world leaders how it's impactful uh, mm-hmm. on on delivering on foreign policy could you tell me a little bit about how these 10 years have mattered as far as this chemistry and credibility is concerned you know uh i mean look uh 
it's not that difficult to appreciate i mean let's for a moment not think of the leaders okay if two people have not met each other have not spoken to each other have not spent time with each other how could they possibly relate to each other mm. i mean it's it's obvious isn't it and yet when you have you know when we say okay india is growing i mean surely if india is growing our interests are growing that means we need to be much more active and much more engaging and there must be that kind of connect because at the end of the day you know leaders do you know a large part of policy making is derived from the judgment that a system especially the system's leader makes mm. you know now if the if i have not even spoken to you 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 know how am i going to influence your judgment so if you if you see the last decade uh, to me one great uh, i would say advantage uh, a tailwind i've had as foreign secretary and now as ef is the fact that in many countries uh, when you go there the fact that the president or the prime minister they know prime minister modi they admire him they've spoken to him they've discussed something they've done something this counts an enormous amount and the hugs and the twitter engagement the uh, ex engagement now uh, or social media the prime minister embrace social media right away and then every meeting that he's had with heads of state and government he tweets about it then those people uh, the heads of government there tweet about it so this is a uh, social media has played a very large role yes in this chemistry and credibility business you know uh, yes it has uh, i think also to some extent they look uh, i mean uh, you know there was that example which was captured by the cameras uh, where where president biden is telling prime minister modi saying you know whatever you have a 70 something percent uh, approval rate so how how do you do it <laughs> uh, so uh, i think other politicians uh, you know like in any competi- competitive uh, profession they look to see okay what does the how is the peer faring okay uh, so uh, for them the fact that you know uh, uh, a prime minister Uh, is doing well in the country the, it could the doing well could be an election result doing well could be 7.7 growth rate doing well could be uh, handling covid doing well could be um, uh, deploying 5g so they make these judgments but at the Why uh, didn't, if if president biden wanted this kind of rating he could have come for the republic day parade he could have got a namaste biden like namaste you trump know, you know i i think that was a different issue because we got you know it was tied to the quad also and mm-hmm. and we couldn't get a landing zone uh, there explain uh, what is landing zone to layman no meaning we we couldn't get everything agreed with everybody mm-hmm. so uh, so therefore it didn't work okay um another quote which i had i found interesting was a nationalist outlook will naturally produce a nationalist democracy now is it something that and and you also say that it's something that the world will need get used to now this is something that many people have written about uh those who have seen indian foreign policy evolve that there is a a kind of a muscular foreign policy now it's a nationalist foreign I would policy say confident domestic. not muscular okay confident no, no. uh your choice yeah. of word um some say like you would say confident some would say it's bombastic at times even because of this uh, the domestic policy is so nationalistic it's reflecting on the international uh, interactions that the prime minister that the foreign minister and everybody else has have we made more friends have we become a vishwamitra or are we imposing our view on on the various mandalas that you talked about which is our neighborhood and then the east asia area no i i look i don't think we are imposing our view because at the end of the day in foreign relations beyond a point you can't impose your view unless you know you are such a big power with such a yeah. huge margin of uh, strength uh, that you can and uh, uh, that is not the case uh, i would certainly say today uh that if you look at the 200 odd countries okay uh if you say where is india today in their consciousness in their awareness i would say in the last 10 years we are very much deeper and stronger uh, in that regard if you say 
do, how many of them feel something has happened in India which is relevant to them? I would again say the answer is yes, those numbers have, have grown. We are seen as more relevant, we are more visible. Uh, we are seen as influencing many more outcomes. So, one, I mean, if you look at it today, many more leaders want to come to India. I mean, one of my big uh, challenges as a foreign minister is really uh, to, uh, to uh, explain why Prime Minister cannot visit every country in the world every year, because mm. everybody wa apparently wants him to come. I'm going to yeah. go into the trouble areas. So, uh, uh, when you talked about, the, when we talk about... No, this is not a trouble area. This is, when you have high demand, I mean, it's in a way a welcome problem. You have many uh, wanting uh, to come here. And many wanting to come, many of them who I... want him to go up. So, uh, I would certainly say today, you know, look, when we say Vishwamitra, just look, I, I give you the example. Vishwamitra of... feels nice. Vishwaguru no, 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 seems threatening no, to no, many. No. I've used the word Vishwamitra and uh, to me, if you want one example of that, it's the G20, that at the G20, look, go back and look at it, 24 hours, not even 12 hours before the G20 uh, declaration was finalized, there were people publicly predicting that we will fail. Okay, now I know some part of it was politically driven, put that aside. Hmm. But the general expectation was, you know, relations today are so polarized on the Ukraine issue, if uh, the uh, concerns of the global south have become so strong and yet, uh, you know, being contested in a way or not being recognized uh, duly by others. So there was a north-south divide, there was a east-west polarization, different countries were pulling in different directions and yet the fact was eventually we got everybody to come to the table. And, and I accept, when they all came to the table, they deserve credit. Mm. But finally, the truth is, they came to the table because everybody ultimately had a relationship with India. Hmm. The other 19 countries said, yes, this, this matters for India. This is something which is right. So let if, because the fact is everybody made a compromise. That's how it happened. Yeah. You know? So, but that uh, happened. And then uh, suddenly we saw ties with Canada plummet. It happened no, literally that, within that, weeks. No, no, but that. What, no, what went wrong that, there? And that, uh, that is, I think, un, I mean, I, I it honestly happened even do not during see. the summit. Uh, look, I do not see a correlation there. No? I mean, uh, getting everybody around on a G20 has nothing to do with the Khalistani issue in, in Canada. I mean, the Khalistani issue is not a new issue. The Khalistani issue has existed for decades. Why do you think that it, is, uh, it has become so uh, such a thorn in the flesh for India-Canada relations? And why do you think Prime Minister Trudeau, for a handful of Khalistanis, has put relationship with India on the rocks? Uh, look, I, I am. I can explain my government, my prime minister, and my book. But you're also an I, academic. I, I, you're also a diplomat. I, I, I do not. I. It's not for me to speculate uh, on other prime ministers. But I will tell you the the issue at heart. The issue at heart is the fact that in Canadian politics, uh, these Khalistani forces have been given a lot of space and have been allowed to indulge in activities which uh, I, I think are damaging to the relationship, clearly uh, not in India's interest, but I would argue not in Canada's interest either. But unfortunately, that is the state of their politics. Hmm. How, do, how do you see the allegations that Canada makes on India with regard to uh, deaths which have taken place, unexplained deaths which they call and the investigations they are doing and compare it with what the Americans and how they, they uh, are reacting. Uh, Smita, I have spoken about this before. Uh, mm. It is not obviously a subject relating to my book mm. and we are not here to do a press conference. Right. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I've been quite, quite clear on this that if somebody gives us something to investigate, we'll look at it. Right. Um, I will move on to, in, in your book, you talk... Uh, yes, let's stay with the book. <laughs> uh, in the book, uh, you, you talk about legacy building also and about how uh, everything that has happened in the Modi era has worked towards a goal. In 2024, um, will India and China bury the hatchet? Because there is a, in one part, you talk about uh, relationship with uh, France and how it has gone forward. You talk about uh, relationship with Japan. These two stand out clearly in the Modi era having uh, taken an upward trajectory. The two which don't take an upward trajectory, one is China, uh, and the other one is, of course, Pakistan. Pakistan barely makes any mention in your book, but mm -hmm. China, 
-hmm. So will it, will steps be taken in 2024 uh, to bury the hatchet? See, I cannot answer that because obviously, uh, as they say, it takes two hands to clap. But I pose the issue and I pose the issue in this manner. That if you look at the last uh, 75 plus years uh, of our foreign policy, uh, we've had a strain of realism about China and we have had a strain of, uh, I can say you can call it idealism, romanticism, non-realism non you can say. And it begins right from, from in our sons from day one, I mean where there is a very sharp difference of opinion how to respond to China between Nehru and Sardar Patel. I'm, I'm giving a certain uh, attitude here. So I would say uh, the Modi government and has been very much more in conformity with the strain of realism which originated from Sardar Patel. And you mentioned the, uh, the romanticism of the Nehruvian era. Yes, yes. Now, and then you talk about no, the and, and I've given some yeah. examples. I mean, where, where, you know, even when it came, for example, uh, to uh, the UN, hmm. uh, UN Security Council seat. Now, again, it's not my case that we should have necessarily taken the seat. It's a, it's a, that's a different debate. But to say that, you know, we should first let China, you know, China's interests should come first. You know, that's, that's a very, uh, it's a very uh, peculiar statement to make. And you, you know? also write that there was no reciprocity in the years after Absolutely. that from China. Yeah, no. So, there is a judgment here. There is first a judgment about what we should do. Then there is a judgment about what you should expect. Hmm. You know? So, I, I think today, you know, what will happen with China? I mean, I argue for dealing with China from a basis of realism, which that strain of realism, which I feel extends all the way from Sardar Patel to Narendra Modi, that is the strain of realism, which I feel uh, should, should uh, allow us to uh, have a certain approach. The alternative strain, which starts from Nehru, Nehru's in a sense China first policy, because yeah. he says, first let China take its seat, then we will see for India. China okay? first. So, from China first policy, it ends up as Chindia policy. I know Today. people had huh. forgotten that horrible term, Chindia. Well, I, I think you, you should mention it. You should ask the inventor of the term. Yeah, it's very cringeworthy yeah. to read it today. But when, there you are. Yeah. Uh, you've been ambassador in China. You've met with several of your predecessors who were foreign ministers. Uh, you as a foreign minister, as an external affairs minister, how do you see uh, the pivot that India has taken with regard to China? No, I, I don't think, look, I don't believe it's a pivot we have taken. You know, we, we have tried to construct a relationship which is based, as I say, on three mutuals. Mm. Uh, and the, the fact is that unless there is a mutuality of, a, you know, that mutuality is recognized, mm. uh, this relationship will find it very difficult to progress. And today, part of our problem uh, is exactly be the, because in 2020, agreements were disregarded. And the, the mutuality on which this whole relationship is predicated has not been followed, that we have the situation we have. So when you ask me where would it go, I would say a uh, lot of it would depend on what is the Chinese policy. In the book, you mention a number of uh, places or times in our history where mind games have to be played mm -hmm. uh, by diplomats, by, uh, by politicians when dealing with uh, other countries. With China, did we always lose out on this mind games thing? No, I don't think we always lost out, but I uh, would argue that uh, at various points of time, uh, you know, we could have, you know, uh, uh, say uh, there was when we talk about uh, the parts of the past which uh, today would be very difficult for someone to understand. The Panchil Agreement is another such example, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I would say that. Uh, 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 today, that's why I come back to Bharat, yeah. that the role of confidence, the role of assurance, the fact, I mean, we are a multiple millennia civilization, you know, all this should be in our demeanor, in our standing and in the way in which we approach other countries. You confuse people because of this uh, demeanor. Let me be honest with you. Uh, you were in Russia 
and you posted that picture and then you were sitting with President Putin and in the Western press there was an absolute meltdown that uh, now Dr. Jay Shankar is there and then there's this bonhomie between President Putin and Prime Minister Modi, untrustworthy uh, friend and ally. The Western media just doesn't know how to read you. No, if, the, if people can't read me, that means my mind games are working. <laughs> okay? uh, but uh, the answer is, honestly, I see no reason uh, that people uh, should uh, take any, you know, what was happening other than at face value. Because we have always maintained that the Russia relationship is a very important one, very steady one. I've written about it in my book. Yeah. And I said it in Moscow. I mean, I said it in publicly in Moscow. Uh, even before my meeting with President Putin happened, which is that we value this relationship. It's a relationship that has served India well. Look, I'm looking at it now from an Indian perspective. And that's also part of being Bharat. Huh? Part of being Bharat is you must look from perspective of your interest, not allow other people to decide your judgment and your uh, your responses. You know, when you, talk, you write about the Quad and then the disappointment when the Quad had to take a back seat, and then it comes up again, mm -hmm. uh, well, it comes into focus when Prime Minister Modi comes in. Again, it comes into focus. So obviously when it's Quad and then there is Russia, who are the new friends? Who are the old friends? Is everybody a friend? This Vishwamitra bit, I know you're going to come back to that. Uh, is everybody a friend? How do you choose your friends and allies? No, uh, again, look, a country which has maximum friends, and minimum adversaries is obviously one with a smart diplomacy. Hmm. So, uh, why would a country restrict its friends? Why would it say, I will choose you and not choose you? Hmm. Unless your interest compelled you to do that. I am today focusing on how do I expand my relationships? How am I more present? How am I uh, more influential? Uh, so, for me, uh, the more friends I have, the more forums I'm member of, the more places where I can uh, influence sway outcomes is good for me. You've now, it's the others who push you, okay. you know, this is the mind games that others play that, you know, they would say, you know, if you are a democracy, you must do this, this, this. So if you should ask them, well, if that is so, please look at the mirror and tell me how you were behaving as a democracy. So everybody, after all, you know, look, it's not like, Every country has its values and beliefs, but every country has its interests as well. And every country finds a balance. So when others come and tell you that you have no interest, that you know you must go by what has been decided elsewhere, that's when you you lack that uh, uh, self-confidence to say, I'm, excuse me, I think I'm going to do something else because I've looked at it very carefully and my interests uh, have uh, uh, taken me in a certain direction, not asked me to take a certain position. But that's exactly what has been happening post G20 in the foreign media, almost on a weekly basis. One is seeing articles that this assertive India uh, on the world stage uh, is happening at one level. And at the other level, it is at the cost of diplomacy, uh, of uh, democracy sliding or democracy <laughs> indicators sliding. Uh, in India. Yeah, but uh, you know, I've, I've not, uh, I've, I made some references to that democracy, yeah. democracy narrative. Uh, uh, that is also a mind game. You know, that is, you know, when, when I people... I am regretting using that word now. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> that but, no, no, but seriously, look, just look at it this way. There are uh, people uh, who uh, apparently feel more confident of their support outside India than inside India. They get support from outside India. So we have this constant barrage. We've had this from 2014. It increased after 2019. I'm sure it will become very shrill as we lead up to uh, the summer of 2024. Who will constantly come at you and, you know, say, you know, you are less of a democracy. You are, I mean, they'll pick uh, what they believe our, our flaws or uh, uh, failings that we have. Again, we must have the confidence to judge it. I'm not saying we're perfect. I'm not saying we don't have room for improvement. Everybody does. We, we certainly do. But I would say, please look at their motive and their agenda. They are not agenda-less. They're not motive-less. They are trying to push a certain line because they have a certain interest. So don't necessarily take what comes in the foreign media at face value. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at the kind of 
you know, uh, shall I say, multiple standards that they practice. I mean, you are talking of the state of dem democracy in this country. I mean, give me any yardstick of democracy. You know, are your elections fair? Is your participation growing? Are, you know, broader and broader sections involved? Uh, are your institutions working? I mean, I would say I'm doing as well as any other democracy. Frankly, I could, if anything, I could be passing a judgments on a whole lot of other uh, democracies. But India doesn't. You know, we are very dignified people and uh, uh, we That's what I want to know. Why is it that India uh, doesn't have its own uh, or the Indian <sighs> government? I'm not talking about just the Modi government, I mean, even the earlier governments. There have been no statements regarding slide of democracy of other countries. I, you have a point. Uh, you have a point. I think part of it is because we also have a tradition where we do not make uh, very intrusive, you know, uh, judgmental statements about other people's politics. That's been uh, part of our tradition. Maybe with the passage of time, that too may change. Many things in the country are changing. Mm. Uh, we were talking about uh, Vishwamitra and the, mm. uh, the friends. And in the book, you mentioned that no country is irrelevant to India. Um, what happened with Pakistan? You did make Pakistan irrelevant to India. No, uh, no, no, no. I, I think... <laughs> I, I I I would not uh, agree with that. You haven't been uh, there. Uh, I I haven't. Sorry. You haven't been to Pakistan. You made it in yeah, as foreign minister. As foreign minister. Uh, well, I think that's partly because uh, uh, of uh, how they reacted. Uh, you know, after 2019. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I I you know I I think the way you're phrasing it is perhaps a bit too strong and doesn't quite capture what is the situation. What Pakistan was trying to do, uh, not now, but over multiple decades, was really to use cross-border terrorism to bring India to the table. Okay, That, in essence, was its core policy. We have made that irrelevant by not, you know, not playing that game. Uh, now, uh, it's not a case that we, you know, that we don't, uh, uh, will not deal with a neighbor. After all, at the end of the day, a neighbor is a neighbor. But it is that we will not deal, you know, on the basis of terms that they set where, where the practice of terrorism is deemed as legitimate uh, and, uh, and effective in order to bring you to the table. You know, uh, talking about relevance and irrelevance, you do mention uh, our neighbours. You talk about Sri Lanka in the book. And uh, is there a new challenge now that we have in Maldives uh, with uh, the the new regime taking a pivot against India towards China? You know, um, the new regime has uh, just come in. Uh, we had a brief meeting uh, between uh, uh, our leaders, our Prime Minister and their President. We have to see where we uh, go on from here because uh, uh, my takeaway from that meeting was that uh, there was a uh, recognition on both sides of the importance of the relationship. So we have to wait to see how that recognition plays out. Right. Coming back to your book, um, you talk in one of them about the three doctrines, the roads not taken. Uh, that I found very interesting. I, I'm sure that will be uh, just for another book at one point of time. Patel, Masani, and, uh, um, and uh, no, four, Ambedkar. I, Patel, Patel on China. Hmm. Uh, Shama Prasad, Dr. Shama, Shama Prasad, Prasad Mukherjee on Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Ambedkar on okay. China and America. Yeah. You know, because people, not many people know how strongly, hmm. how much he was disturbed by. Uh, yeah. The manner in which our relationship with the U.S. Uh, did not fare well uh, in that mm -hmm. period. And uh, finally, uh, Minu Masani, because Minu Masani I referred to in terms of, you know, where sometimes this the practice of non-alignment could end up doing, which is, you know, uh, you could lose your bearings. I mean, that's essentially what he's saying. Yeah. Now, it's not, you know, it's I have again tried to be very objective. It's not my case that somebody is wrong and somebody is right. My purpose of writing the chapter was to remind people that, look, what you take as, as a given, that this was the only course which India could have followed, may not be true. That at that time, many years ago, there were very intense debate. After all, these are your key, three key relationships, yeah. China, Pakistan, America. 
on these three key relationships there were very major debates and choices were made mm. and today after after seven and a half decades uh, it's important we look at those choices if only to ask ourselves and see whether there is wisdom to be gained uh, from that and certainly today when you look at those three choices i i would those three accounts i would suggest to you that a lot of what they had to say maybe had more merit than people thought at that time so the students of uh, international relations uh, you give like a teaser uh, in mm -hmm. this about the conversations and about shama prasad and in that uh, like in one of them which you said as mukherji was to state in parliament india went to the security council on the question of aggression not on the question no, of so sovereignty of accession mm. so this was a very interesting point if students of uh, foreign policy want to read about this those who are studying it uh, where should one uh, go to read about these conversations and about this uh, nehru know, memorial uh, library no i mean no, no, now no, prime no, minister no, sangrale now now you get so much hmm. uh, so much uh, on the net i mean hmm. uh, uh, in fact uh, even in youtube lot of this historical yeah. Uh, material is played out uh, i i would say uh, it is important for people uh, to revisit and again look i am not i'm genuinely not being partisan about it you know i'm not there would be there would be decisions taken in the uh, 50s and 60s which may have, which would have been very sound and today we were confronted with the same situation we may take that we were too trusting uh in that era are we more hard nosed now i think that's i don't know if it is uh, trusting i've kind of addressed that issue i i think there was a ideological bent of mind which in fact trusted some and distrusted others hmm. so it wasn't just that you trusted everybody you know there were also uh, antipathies vis-a-vis -vis certain powers yeah uh, correct and the us was one of them yes that this is the pivot that i was talking about the number of pivots that uh, uh, india has taken i i'm another quote that you uh, which i picked up was uh, economic crisis ended up being a strategic correction um what uh, if you could expand on that and how many times did that happen in the past 10 years when modi has been prime minister uh, you see well, uh, i my recollection is i refer here hmm. to how we reached out to the asean huh and then how that became a policy beyond uh, beyond that you know uh, and today in a way all of that has led to the indo indo pacific so if you remember at that time uh, we had a balance of payments crisis uh, 91 92 uh, from that uh, the uh, decision was made to uh, to liberalize the economy undertake reforms yeah. and uh, look for different you know more partners different partners and that quest in many ways to cross uh, to asean uh, and the uh, relationship in that 1990s grew very very strongly and what it did was it really became then the base to go beyond the asean mm -hmm. you know to uh, to japan to korea uh, economically uh, to china uh, to uh, to recently much more after, particularly after modi has come to australia hmm? uh, so my point was the trigger was an economic, economic crisis. crisis but if you see the consequences it was uh, it ended up as something much bigger now uh, in the big changes during the modi period the last 10 years i would not say that they were necessarily economic uh, crisis which triggered for example uh, he has completely transformed our relationship with the gulf mm. you know if you look today at you know the quality of our relationship the the visits we have the uh, uh, the the you know the different facets of the relationship uh, now there was no crisis which was driving it it was driven because he had a policy you know he had a certain understanding of why this region was important and he took the initiative and the strategic correction with israel uh, also no uh, israel well, if I you were to expand that no, west asia I, I, thing? Th i think israel was a much longer debate Uh, in our country i have referred to it very yeah. you know uh, yeah, in, barely in, in actually passing. in the book yeah yeah because mine is a general description it's not an in depth but israel was also connected very much with our domestic politics mm. that there were very conscious judgments which were made uh, you know uh, when at the in early years 
that for political reasons in India, we will not really establish a full ambassadorial relationship uh, with Israel and will keep a distance. And the fact is, you know, after all, ask yourself, from 1948, it was, it was only 2017 that the first prime minister's visit from India took place to Israel. I mean, surely there's a reason. And that reason is a political reason. Many times it's said that uh, domestic policy has influenced uh, the Modi government's foreign policy. But by reading this book... It has influenced every government's foreign policy. Exactly. It, it was not less uh, in, the, in the earlier era, including in the Nehru era. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to come to. That Can you give us one or two instances where you feel, one you've just told us about. Uh, and because you've worked with... Uh, the, uh, the Indira Gandhi government, the Rajiv Gandhi government, and uh, subsequently Dr. Manmohan Singh and the others. Did, did you find uh, that this uh, domestic policy influencing foreign policy is something which is a continuous strain or was it enhanced more during the Modi era? You know, I, I would say uh, it's a mix. Hmm. Uh, you know, there are certain, uh, certain uh, interests and certain... Uh, I would say preferences, which you can say are come more from a broad national thinking, which are less, uh, you know, less susceptible to change. Mm. Uh, governments come and governments go, but they don't change that much. But there will be some where they reflect very much the the viewpoint uh, of the of the political uh, mm. regime in power, uh, and I, not necessarily the political party, but. Uh, it could be the political party, it could be the regime, it could be an individual, it could be a group. Okay. Uh, I, I'll give you examples, you know. To me, the, the, uh, the improvement uh, uh, in relations with Israel very clearly reflects the fact that the BJP is in power. I don't think uh, that those, the changes we have seen in the last 10 years, you know, uh, would have happened if some other party was mm -hmm. in power rather than the BJP. That's one example. At the same time, I would say the, uh, the attitude we took towards China uh, in the 1950s, you know, uh, the manner in which we supported them on a range of issues, and, and I've referred to that in Roads Not Taken, mm -hmm. uh, and also in the China chapter. It would not have happened had the Congress party not been in power and had Prime Minister Nehru not been the foreign minister and the prime minister. I think it was very much his personal uh, proclivity. Uh, the same, in a sense, I would say about taking Kashmir to the UN, that it was something very much which was Prime Minister Nehru's uh, personal uh, push, which uh, took us, uh, took that issue uh, to, the, to the UN. So, uh, again, Pakistan policy in the roads not taken. One of the reasons I've used uh, Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee as a counterfoil is that at that time there were, there was someone like him who was cautioning the government saying, look, uh, you know, you, you are entering this nehru Liaquat uh, pact uh, where they have no intention of honoring what was happening. It was not something we realized decades later. Mm -hmm. As you are signing the pact, a minister of the cabinet is telling you, saying, look, don't do this. And Abedkar on the nation first, which you talk yeah. about in the so, book also. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I would say, uh, I think uh, there is a lot, uh, you know, as I said, there's a lot that is national, but there is a lot that is political. In the book, you talk, uh, and I'm quoting again, uh, the surge in India's self-confidence. And you talk about uh, aspirational India. Refer to this uh, uh, several times. Uh, what has been your feedback in the past 10 years of the Modi government? What do people, when you, you interact, you go to college campuses, you meet with people, you meet with students. I've seen you interacting uh, with the youth. What do they expect of you as a foreign minister? Uh, I think that's a good note to conclude our talk. Uh, yes. And uh, uh, I would say that, you know, I find today young people really very interested in the world. Mm. Okay. Uh, having, you know, developed that interest, uh, they, they want, you know, they want to talk to people who can explain it to them in, in uh, you know, not very complicated, not in jargon, uh, not, not with too many complications. They have, I think, an understandable pride uh, about their country uh, and, you know, uh, our, our uh, and what we are as a people. 
and uh, they they clearly like that to be projected uh, at the world stage uh, they i think respond favorably uh, if they feel that you know people are trying to push us around and you will not be pushed around i i think they take that well uh, i you know i i don't think you know it's not their expectation that we will uh, be hyper you know but they like the fact if you stand your ground mm -hmm. so to me actually in many ways these interactions of which i've done a lot in the last 5 years they have been for me a very interesting um, sort of motivator because it it's like you know you're getting it's like a focus group you're getting audience response even when you are penning your thoughts uh, and they they in many ways are the people for whom i am writing this book mm -hmm. that i am trying to capture uh, those uh, multiple conversations i've had uh, with different people a lot of it very spontaneous very natural you know people come up to you on a plane in an airport uh, in a public place what do they say uh, to you sir aap ye kijiye sir aap wo kijiye do they do that not quite but they they i mean depending on the setting hmm. uh, you know they they kind of uh, express support or they they no and there is some of what you say which yeah. is you know wish humko ye karna chahiye you know hmm. that there is some of that yeah, yeah. so uh, while reading the book i was trying to get hints and i'm sure many will ask you this are you really going to take the plunge in 2024 and contest the lok sabha elections uh, that's that's a pass i've answered all your other questions so thank, thank you so much sir for uh, explaining and uh, success uh, to this book from us thank, thank you thank you, thank you.